So welcome along to another Dicker Data Training Academy webinar. My name is Robert Crane and you can find me on the Twitter at Director CIA. So just highlighting that the webinar has now started, um, you should all be able to hear me. If you have any questions uh, along the way, please send those to microsoft.sales.dickerdata.com.au. We do have a chat window going, but uh, we can't guarantee that we can get to all the questions. So again, the session is being recorded and will be made available after the fact for those who wish to review it. Now, we've had um, basically uh, three webinars now in June. The last one we had uh, basically was on uh, preparing for Office 365. We're now going to dive into the migration to Office 365. Next week, uh, 23rd of June, we're not going to schedule a webinar being the end of the financial year, so we'll let you all go and wind up your businesses uh, tax-wise for the end of the financial year, but we will be kicking off again on the following Wednesday, which is the 1st of July. Uh, we're going to advise uh, on the topic and we'll give you an option for inputting on that shortly uh, as we get towards the end of the session. So keep in mind uh, what sort of topics you'd like to see down the track uh, for these webinars to cover. But with that, let's do a quick review of the two webinars we've had so far. So webinar one covered basically what Office 365 was. Now importantly, Office 365 is more than just the desktop applications. It's more than just Excel, Word and PowerPoint. It is a number of services also delivered from the cloud. So we can get Office on the desktop, but we can also get Exchange, we get SharePoint and OneDrive, and we also get Skype for Business, which is the medium that we're currently using at the moment to present these webinars. Now, you can typically buy Office 365 a number of different ways through a number of different channels, including using your credit card or via Open through uh, Dicka. Now, typically there are two stacks of Office 365. One is the business stack, one is the enterprise stack. Each uh, have a number of different suites and there are some important differences between these stacks. So we start off with just the business or the Pro Plus, which is just the desktop applications plus some web-based storage in OneDrive. We then have the business essentials, which is just the cloud services. So Exchange, SharePoint, um, Skype for Business. This is typically aimed at customers who already have a current version of Office or not looking to upgrade immediately. On the enterprise side, that equivalent is called an E1. The suite that incorporates both the desktop software and the cloud services is Business Premium and on the enterprise it is E3. Now there are some big differences between the enterprise and the business premium. Some of these that were highlighted was that the business uh, office from the business side of the scale doesn't provide RDS rights. So to have RDS rights, terminal server rights, you need to have an enterprise license. The enterprise license also gives you an office version that includes access and info path, where business premium, for example, doesn't include that. Now, not only can you buy Office 365 as a suite, you can also purchase it as individual items. So we can purchase, for example, just Exchange Online. We could buy OneDrive for Business or maybe Project or Visio. We can then now generally mix and match uh, those licenses within a single tenant. So we can have some users with Business, some users with Business Premium, others with uh, Enterprise E3 and maybe for kiosk users or people who are out in the warehouse, just a kiosk license or exchange online. So one of the important differentiations now with Office 365 is the ability to mix and match all the SKUs and all the licenses um, within that environment. So let's review webinar two. So in webinar two, we looked at setting up um, Office 365 and what we basically found there was that if you can you really should be using PowerShell to give you that repeatable process that you can basically craft once and run many times against uh, different Office 365 tenants. We should be using a checklist. Uh, a lot of the Office 365 stuff is very similar. The interface gives us the standard features across all our plans. Therefore, if we have a checklist to ensure that we've collected all the information, got all the users, picked up the right domains, understood what the client has, what needs to be done, we can then apply that checklist against future um, installation. So again, checklisting is very, very handy, reduces time, saves money and gives you a consistent result. 
One of the big takeaways when you're setting up your Office 365 is to ensure that the auto discover record is correctly configured. So um, there's an auto discover record that's required in the DNS and there may also be auto discover records that are configured on the local group policy within your network. So again, make sure that you have those auto discovery records set up correctly. There are tests that you can run um, from Microsoft and other providers that will tell you where your auto discovery record is pointing, but if it is not pointing in the right location, you're going to get issues with clients trying to connect their Outlook and, the, and to their mail, and that was really a problem that you don't want to have. So again, make sure that you check your auto discovery record is correctly configured. Uh, make sure that you look at your user adoption strategy. It's all well and good to migrate users from one platform to another. Office 365 provides a number of major changes and a number of major advantages and the user will need help in discovering those, working with those, understanding what's different, uh, appreciating how to make the most of the new features and facilities that they have. So make sure that you have an adoption strategy which basically comes down to good training. You can automate that, you can create videos, but you can then make that a consistent delivery item to provide your uh, customers uh, one after each other. Don't forget that we've also got a number of advanced features and services in Office 365. So if you implement, uh, you know, moving from maybe small business server where you move the exchange and maybe move some SharePoint stuff, don't forget that you also get things like Yammer across all plans, which is a unique feature a lot of users have never seen. Skype for business is another option. So again, just don't do the basics. Look where you can add value. Look where you can potentially generate some more revenue uh, by implementing these advanced services and features that are now part of Office 365 that weren't part of the options available on premise. And one of the most important things I think is to make sure that you know how to log a support issue. So remember that support with Office 365 is a free and included option and you can now include that uh, logging a service call directly. Now if you have a delegated admin you can do that on behalf of your customer and if you do have a problem log it with Microsoft they get onto it very quick they'll get back to you. If you manage to solve the problem that's great but uh, if Microsoft can solve it quicker than you, well, then you get the same result. So importantly, again, don't be afraid to go in and log a support issue if there are any problems that do arise. Very straightforward, and you'd be surprised at the results that it can uh, generate for you. Okay, so let's move on to today's webinar. We're going to cover um, our migration. We're going to look at some considerations when we do migrate, some email migrations, data, optional components, third-party applications, look at some decommissioning options and, and then best practices takeaway. So the idea here is to cover uh, what we can in the time period we're allocated. We're not going to be able to do necessarily a deep dive into each option. I'm going to try and point out some commonalities, but then also highlight some things that I've seen um, that a lot of people miss and uh, you should put on your radar. So let's start with considerations. When we go to do a migration, uh, as with any migration, no matter whether it's on-premise or to wherever, document, documentation and planning is the key. You need to sit down and you need to prepare the installation, how many users, how long is it going to take, where are the services, how many files, how long is it going to take, um, have a whole documented process. Again, based on your checklists and all that sort of information, the good thing here is that documentation and planning can then be applied across the next client, the one after the one after, and refined as you go along. So just because it's a migration from uh, on-premise to the cloud doesn't uh, alleviate the need to have good documentation and planning. And you'll probably also find that a lot of the documentation and planning you already have for your network migrations will apply to Office 365. Because in a lot of cases, you're doing something similar like an uh, exchange to exchange migration. Again, as we highlighted in the very first thing when we we're talking about Office 365, bandwidth is um, a consideration here. Again, not all customers have great bandwidth. We appreciate that. Um, it may be, uh, don't rule it out because it's always improving. Uh, but again, have a think about what can be practically migrated. Are you going to use the customer's link? Are you going to take some of the data back to your organization, perhaps, which has a, a stronger link? Maybe put it to a data center and upload it from there. Um, what are the options that are available? Now, remember that a migration doesn't necessarily have to be an all or nothing proposition. Many customers come to you and say, yes, we want everything into the cloud. We don't want any servers. But 
there may be some practical limits when it comes to the bandwidth that they currently have. And as we highlighted during our initial webinar, make sure that you go back and verify and check that bandwidth to make sure that you're getting the most optimal, the client's getting the most optimal, because that's going to be a key limiting factor when it comes to things like migration. But remember, what actually needs to be migrated and how is that going to happen? Over the client's bandwidth, perhaps over yours, or via another method. Which users are going to need what license? So in this world now of Office 365, we can mix and match. That's great. We can have multiple users using a suite. We can have some users using standalone features. We can have all sorts of different options here. But remember, what license are they going to allocate? You're going to have to go in, even if you're using DirSync, you're going to have to go in and allocate those licenses. So again, a nice spreadsheet where it's listed everybody out. Uh, what licenses they have is going to make it a lot easier when it comes to applying those licenses. The other question when it comes to licensing and user identification is how are they authenticating? Are we doing all cloud-based identities? Are we doing uh, a local AD via DirSync? Are we doing something more complex? So how are users going to authenticate? How are they going to log into the service? Now this may have an impact also for third-party applications. So if you're logging into a third-party CRM or some other management system, how are they now going to authenticate? If you remove the AD and go all cloud-based, that may not be possible. So an AD server may be required on-premise. So again, ask the question about how the users are going to authenticate in the Office 365 tenant. One of the next features I'd strongly recommend is no matter what you do is you need to go in and you need to clean up your local AD. Uh, most people uh, will uh, take on customers and those ADs have been let uh, go to the weeds generally um, over time. So uh, there is a tool from Microsoft which we'll point out shortly. But make sure you clean up the local AD. Are the users in there valid? Do they have the right email addresses? Uh, do, do some of them need to be deleted? What about orphan objects? Um, again, run these checks to make sure your AD is clean. If you're using your AD to do DirSync or ADFS, um, then it becomes the sing potentially a single point of identity for your Office 365 environment. You want that to be as clean and tidy as possible. So first step is always to go in and clean up the AD no matter what migration strategy you're going to use. The next item I bring to your attention is it is absolutely critical to get control of the DNS records. The DNS records are going to have to be changed and pointed to Office 365 services, typically the MX record, but potentially the name server record as well. So many migrations I've seen stalled at the very last moment because the reseller couldn't get access to the DNS or the DNS password was incorrect or actually wasn't with that hoster, right? Make sure that you have access to the DNS and that means you've logged in, you've tested, you understand how to change uh, the records. If you're not managing it, understand how long that is going to take. If you need to make a request to change an MX record and somebody else is doing it, how long is that going to take? How are you going to be able to check that process is actually done? Because again, I've seen many cases where we don't control the DNS or the reseller doesn't control the DNS. They make a request for, for an MX record to be changed through a reseller, through a uh, service provider's portal, and then it gets missed. It doesn't get checked. It doesn't get updated, and the whole migration basically gets delayed. So make sure um, that you have access to the DNS records and that you can actually modify them and point them into different locations. Next question to consider is how much data are you going to migrate? Because you've got your email data, gigs and gigs and gigs, and potentially you could have file data as well. Maybe you've got a whole lot of stuff that's got to go to OneDrive or SharePoint or something else. How much data is it going to take? You can only fit so much down um, a pipe. Okay, so remember, think about this. Maybe you need to do a stage migration. What can be pulled out and migrated beforehand? What's the current information? Many of the tools in email allow you to do stage migrations where you can migrate the old stuff in the background and then do the new stuff later. But again, sit down and actually do a calculation and say, well, we've got this much data in general over this bandwidth. It's going to take us one, two, three, five, six, seven, however many days to get it up there because that's going to be generally the limiting factor of your migration. Okay, so again, appreciate and understand how much data needs to be migrated, both email and file data. Now, generally, the point of no return is your MX record cutover. This is the same with any uh, email migration uh, generally. But remember, is when you change that MX record, it could take up to 72 hours for that to propagate through the system for users to be receiving new emails. Generally, it will, won't take that long. But 
it may. So again, once that MX record gets changed over, the email generally won't be flowing into the old location, it'll be flowing into the new location, but there'll be a transitory period where it may end up in either location. How are you going to handle that? What's the process? Nine times out of 10, best practice is generally to do an MX record cutover, maybe on a Friday afternoon late-ish, so that you've got the weekend to manage that. But again, what's the fallback? If the MX record doesn't work or there are problems or something happens, what's the fallback? What's the issue? How do we manage this in the case that you know the emails are not correct? Is there a hotmail address that we can fall back to? I mean, again, worst case scenario, but remember, the MX record changeover is generally the point of no return when you're pointing from on-premise into Office 365. Now, in all of this, uh, typically customers have more than just Microsoft applications. They have third-party applications. They may be SQL databases. They may be accounting software. Again, how are these applications going to be migrated? Are they going to be put on a hosted server? Are they going to stay on-premise? Are they going to be uh, migrated to a PaaS system, platform as a service. Uh, what's going to happen there? Who's going to look after that? Who's going to manage that? Can you get into these systems? How up to date are they? And importantly, uh, how are they? How do they get their identity? So, do they pull from the local AD? Do they have their own username and password database? Uh, how is that managed? Because that's going to have a major impact if you move the identity to a cloud-based identity and remove a local ID. How is a third-party application then going to authenticate the users? So. Don't forget those third-party applications. A lot of them could be something as simple as a machine in the back corner running an old version of Windows that may be monitoring photocopiers or something like that. It's a critical piece of infrastructure that's tucked away and forgotten and requires maybe AD login. So again, be very aware that when you do your scoping process, you are aware of any third-party applications and their dependencies. As I mentioned before, user adoption is absolutely critical. There's no question that there's a lot of change aside from email. Email sounds very similar, but when it comes to SharePoint, Skype for Business, Yammer, Delve, all these sort of add-ons, that's a big change for a user. Now, not all users are receptive to these sort of changes. So make sure that you've got a process in place for these users to go and ask questions, help them, train them, get them started, make them feel comfortable with the product. Because if they are not adopting the product, if they are struggling, then you're going to struggle because they are going to be asking lots and lots of questions and um, keeping you up at night when it comes to migration. So again, just a quick ask if you're on the call, please make sure that you do mute your microphone. So here's some general tools for you. The first one here is called ID Fix from Microsoft. The link is there. This will allow you to go in, report on your AD, problems that it has, things that need to be cleaned up. So again, make sure you run ID Fix on your AD at all times, but especially if you're planning to do integration with DirSync or potentially ADFS. There's a network planning and performance tuning for Office 365. This will give you ideas of bandwidth requirements, um, the, what the services consume, what firewall ports need to be open, all those sort of things. So have a look at that. The Office 365 service descriptions will tell you what each plan includes, what each license includes, what facilities and features it has. If you want RDS rights, as we mentioned, you need the enterprise SKUs to achieve that. Um, if you need access, again, you're going to need Office Pro Plus, not Office from the business side of things. So make sure that you understand and you have a look at the service descriptions to ensure they do exactly what um, is planned because don't forget, there is an Exchange Online Plan 1 and 2. There is a SharePoint Online Plan 1 and 2 and different plans are included in the suite. So again, if you need the more advanced features, make sure you appreciate and understand uh, which suites those features are included in. And as I mentioned, uh, make sure that you've got control of your DNS. So in Office 365, what we can do is we can either manage the DNS ourselves through a third-party product uh, provider, or you can point the name servers to Office 365 and let them manage the DNS for you. Now, that means that you have minimal control when you do that, but if things change, then it's all handled. If instead you want to create it on your own hosting provider, then you'll need to create a dozen or so records and manage and maintain that. So that's why it's important that, as I said, that you have full control of your customer's DNS so that they can make the changes that are required to bring up all the Office 365 services. And that document there will give you an idea of how to do that on a hosting provider outside 
of Office 365. Now let's go into email migration. Now email migration is generally pretty straightforward. Most people have familiarity with how to migrate emails. You're typically going from a user's inbox to another user's inbox, fairly straightforward. So I'm not gonna spend a lot of time uh, delving into what's required there. I think a lot of people know that. But what I'm gonna highlight here is things that I see trip people up, especially things like shared mailboxes. How many shared mailboxes are there? Info at, sales at, um, who's using them? Uh, how are they using them? Who's got access? Uh, are they going to go forward? Uh, again, so those shared mailboxes will have rights. Are they going to be uh, replicated? How are they going to be migrated? So again, make sure you do due diligence and have a look for shared mailboxes. Another one is mailbox permissions. Typically we see that with the CEO who has a mailbox and maybe a calendar and their PA is managing both of those or perhaps they're managing part of it. So again, remember to have a think about the mailbox permissions. They may or may not be migrated depending on the tool that you select. So mailbox permissions generally are something that is overlooked quite uh, readily and can be quite a bit of a pain to sit down and work out what's going on when the original system is no longer available. So again, make sure you work your way and understand and ask questions about the mailbox permissions for each user. Maybe not valid for everybody, but there are a lot of people out there who still do use public folders. So do they need to be migrated? How are they going to be managed? Are they going to work best in the cloud? Maybe some of that goes to potentially a team site. Um, how's that going to be managed? So again, I've seen a couple of instances where uh, the migration has been completed and the customer comes and says, oh, we can't get access to a shared calendar. That shared calendar happened to be in a public folder and then it was a bit of scrambling to get it across. So public folders are supported in Office 365. They are available on all plans. Um, if you can, you can do migration. Some tools will allow you to migrate directly, whereas other tools won't. But again, keep in mind that public folders may also be in use by your customer. Generally, what we're going to see is you're going to set up a background synchronization prior to the cutover of your email. So you run typically a third party tool or one from Microsoft that will synchronize the email information from people's email, email boxes to Office 365 before the MX record cutover. This is great, allows you to stage the migration. But a couple of options, a couple of things to keep in mind here. That information that's being migrated is being pulled out from typically the user's server, which means it is consuming bandwidth. So again, if you're doing the email migration in the background, running it through the day, um, that's going to be happening over the same bandwidth the users are trying to use to complete their job. So keep that in mind. The other thing to remember here that I've seen a lot of recently is issues around appointments. So a person makes an appointment in the past, uh, you do a background sync, and then that person then returns later after the synchronized, initial synchronization has happened, and they then change that appointment. So then when the synchronization um, completes, it doesn't pick up the changes to the appointment because for whatever reason, the tool may not see the appointment changes. So keep those things in mind. In general, you want to do the appointments if you can, the very last thing before cutoff, but make sure that you understand that what is actually synchronization and what is actually copying. So a lot of tools um, may read as synchronization, but in fact, they're actually a copy, a one-way copy, which means once they've seen an item and copied it, they don't go back and copy it again. So just beware of um, that sort of hiccup that can happen. As I mentioned, MX cutover, um, make sure that you've got access to your DNS record. That's your point of no return normally when it comes to email. Um, plan that, manage that. How's that going to happen? How long is it going to take? What's the worst case scenario? How do we potentially roll back? So understand how to change the MX record, what impact that's going to take, how long it's going to take to change, and how you're going to test to make sure that that is working. And don't forget mobile devices. So many people do the email migration thinking it's just desktop. A lot of users these days are working on mobile devices. They need to get it on their phone. They need to update. That's the way they get it. They may also be overseas when the migration happens. They may be out of the country or out of the state. How are you going to set up and manage those mobile devices and get them to put in the configuration and do that? Office 365 has a number of options to do that. There are third party products that will do that but don't neglect the fact that a lot of people are working on mobile devices and generally they're probably working on multiple devices. They've got a tablet, they've got a phone and they've got a desktop. So don't just go in there thinking one user, one device. It's very much not the case anymore. 
Now, on a business point of view, what I'll point out here is that email migrations are typically a once-off. So once you've done the email migration to Office 365, that's probably going to be the last email migration that the customer is going to require. Um, so again, not a lot more business there. And even the migration side of it is fast to become a commodity. There are a lot of third-party products, which we'll cover in a minute, and tools and options, and people doing this as a service. So generally, you're not going to be making money today uh, doing a migration, and that is also going to continue into the future. And the fact that uh, basic less and less people will need email migration, and it'll be done cheaper and cheaper and cheaper. So again, don't look to uh, email migrations as a potential source of ongoing revenue. They will have a limited lifespan and the, what you can charge for them will continue to decrease. decrease. So not a great uh, business opportunity there, I believe. So some email migration tools you can use. Now, Microsoft has a number of tools built into the Office 365 product. You can suck from your Exchange server or other servers um, using IMAP if you want. You can also use uh, Exchange methods using a cutover and stage methods. Again, these have different requirements, different ways they go about it. But at the end of the day, they move mail from an Exchange server, typically to Office 365, included with the uh, Office 365 products, so no additional cost to charge there, again, server to server based. And what Microsoft has recently announced now is the ability to do a PST import. So if you can create the PSTs, you can then upload those into the data center and potentially then apply those to mailboxes. That service is running, is still running um, rolling out for a number of data centers, including Australia, but it's only a short amount of time before that becomes available. So if your customer's got limited bandwidth and lots and lots of emails, you could potentially export to PST, take it back to your location and then import it into their Office 365 via your good bandwidth. So a couple of different options available for free with the uh, Microsoft uh, Office 365. Now outside that we have tools like MigrationWiz, I've been around for a long time, basically do server to server migrations, they can also do from Gmail, they can also do from Yahoo Mail, Pop Mail, uh, directly into Office 365. There's a cost per mailbox to do that, these products will do a background synchronization, so you can kick the, the migration off perhaps or the copy off uh, a week or two before the MX record cutover and it will then copy all the old emails up progressively and make that ready and available in Office 365. Again, sign up, try the tool, um, use it, understand, see what it does, what it doesn't do, but again, very good automated process to reduce uh, the amount of time and make you uh, more productive. Now, the other option here is Skykick. Skykick is a more expensive, more full-featured version, uh, whereas MigrationWiz and the Microsoft typically do server-to-server. -server. The Skykick can also be extended to do the desktop configuration. In my experience, the majority of cost, the majority of time taken in migration is always at the user's desktop. Um, their outlook is not up to date. They've got some corruption. Um, the profiles don't work. It's typically something unique to that workstation. So outsourcing that to someone like Skykick who can potentially do it from end to end and automate it for you um, is a very good option. And this is an indication of the way that migration services are going. A company like Skykick uh, focuses on this. This is what it does day in and day out and provides that service to resellers directly. Uh, again, reducing the overhead and uh, allowing them to get a better result and a quicker result because they can automate the whole process. So again, have a look at those three options and just determine what works best for your business. Now, Data migrations are a completely different kettle of fish, okay? What I will start off saying is Office 365 is not Server 365. It is not just a case of dragging and dropping the files from a file share into OneDrive or into a team site and then walking away. That is a recipe for disaster, for poor user experience, for all sorts of problems, okay? SharePoint is a collaboration space. It is not uh, designed to be um, a file server replacement in the cloud. There are a lot of caveats, a lot of differences between them. That therefore leads to the fact that to do data migrations, you really need to understand SharePoint. You really need to understand at a base level what SharePoint is. What's the difference between a team site and OneDrive for business? Both are SharePoint. 
A team, uh, one drive for business is a limited subset of what a team site is about. But if you don't understand SharePoint, you are going to struggle. You're going to have issues. You're going to have um, all sorts of questions from the customer about how to access their files and folders. What's the most optimal way to do it? How to use version control? Check in, check out. All the basics um, that SharePoint includes are a huge amount of benefit. But if you don't know them, um, it can be a real struggle. So one of the things I would say when it comes to data migration, you really need to understand SharePoint at even the most basic level. When we do a data migration, are we going to put the information in a team site or are we going to put it in a OneDrive for Business? So OneDrive for Business is a uh, location dedicated to each user, generally for their own user files that they're working on individually. A team site is a location where files go where multiple users are working on it. So this is typically where your traditional network file shares will end up. But again, part of it is it, it may be a decision here. There are some limitations and there are some restrictions and there are some benefits of both um, options. But understanding the differences between team sites and OneDrive for Business will certainly help you understand, uh, appreciate where to put the data. And I will tell you that restructuring is going to be required. Again, you just can't drag and drop a whole file, uh, folder structure from a network share into SharePoint. Typically, you're going to have to break it up. Typically, you're going to have to reorder it. Maybe you throw away some stuff. Maybe you archive some stuff. Maybe you put stuff in an archive that you don't touch. Um, it's very important to understand that restructuring will be required and this is where the value add can be had helping customers get the most out of it because in nine times out of ten their data structure is just grown, grown wild and is unruly. Here's a good opportunity to, to rebuild that, to work with the client to help them get the most out of their data structure. It doesn't have to be massive but again if you understand SharePoint OneDrive is relatively easy to break up and put into manageable items so that it can be working on the web, on a mobile device and synchronized to the desktop if required. And again I'll point out that you're moving from files and folders which is a very dumb um, basic system to a complete collaboration environment with document management, check in, check out, document routing, all these sort of features that are now available. This is a very different experience from just going to an F drive and finding a folder then opening a file. Okay, that is a, a great shock to a lot of users that things have to be done differently. And this is where the adoption is so important to help them ease into that process. There are a huge amount of benefits. They will see a lot of benefits, but they need to be shown the benefits um, trained how to use them and this is a value add that you can add as a business going forward. So again, email migrations probably going to commodity, data migrations probably becoming more and more customised because of the need to look at the customer's data. And again, don't forget overlooking, uh, don't overlook the fact of your mobile users. How are they going to get access to the, the data that you migrate? How are they going to get access um, to open a file, to check it in, check it out on their iPhone or their Windows phone or their tablet? Okay, they're going to be moving from an environment where they VPN'd in maybe or they didn't even have access or they copied the files to their device. Um, again, how is that going to work for the mobile user, which is a growing part of our business requirements these days? So some data migration tools for you. Uh, Microsoft, the easy migration tool is Windows Explorer. You can um, open Windows Explorer and you can copy and paste from um, the file system into SharePoint or OneDrive. Not the recommended option, but free tool. Certainly you can do it for small amounts of data. Third party tools, um, ShareGate uh, is probably a very common one uh, that allows you to migrate from on-premise file shares or other SharePoint environments into uh, Office 365 and back, manage permissions, again, do all that sort of stuff. Another tool that I've implemented is Metalogix. So the, the tool here is they have a, a what they call an express version that will give you a free 25 gigs at a time so you can migrate or work with up to 25 gigs worth of data from your on-premise location file shares or SharePoint company web into Office 365 so there are free tools available um, but a tool like ShareGate which is a full function product um, is a commercial product and does require um, purchasing and licensing. Now the basis of it for most users is, or most businesses is going to be their email and their data. But again, don't be, don't limit yourself to just that. Think about, you know, Skype for Business. How are we going? Once we've done the migration, does Skype implementing Skype for Business will have low impact on the business? Allow them to communicate, having chats. Um, if you're 
organizations using Skype for Business, you can connect in with your clients so they can chat with you directly, ask you questions, do web conferencing like we're doing now. So again, even though the data migration is going to have its hiccups, going to have its challenges, implementing a new product like Skype for Business and showing the benefits is really going to get the customer jazzed about it and less likely to focus on the negatives that may arise due to some data migration issues that are beyond your control. Another product like this is Yammer. So Yammer is a great way, social enterprise social network, of reducing the amount of emails within an organization, which they're always up for. Uh, Office 365 groups are a combination between an email distribution list and a basic OneDrive site. So it basically allows a distribution list in email to have a location to store files and share a common calendar. Many users have this great need. Again, something only available in Office 365. So look at implementing it, getting the customers solve that business problem for them. And again, part of the data that we talked about just doesn't drag and drop. Maybe part of the data goes into an Office 365 group to give them the functionality. But again, these optional components will sell the sizzle, will give people the advantages and stop them from necessarily focusing on the negative side of it. And don't forget other customization options. You've got things in Windows Azure, you can customize the look, you can put logos, you can do banners. Again, customization goes a long way to user adoption and getting users to buy into um, the whole migration process. Don't forget our third party applications. Are they going to stay on premise? Are they going to go to a data center? Do they need an upgrade of a server? Um, what's actually happening with them? Go and ask the question. Once you've asked the question, how's the identity going to be managed? How are users going to log into this third party system, which is probably going to be outside Office 365? Are they going to need AD login? Is it going to be cloud-based? How's that going to be managed? So identity for third party apps is very, very important. And, and what other systems do they interact with? So for example, does um, the CRM system that's a third party app have to send emails via someone's Outlook or send it via Exchange Server? Um, you can configure Office 365 to be an SMTP relay, but how do you do that? Does it work? Will it be supported with a third party app? How does the third party interact with files and folders? Does it need somewhere to share its files, um, save files? Will that work? Um, saving it to the cloud with something like SharePoint and Team Sites? Again, ask these questions early to avoid pain. And most importantly, who's going to be looking after it? Who's going to migrate? Is it something you're going to do, something you're going to offer? If not, who's the contact party? Are they prepared? How are they going to work in with your migration plan over time? So again, third party apps can very much be a trip up point because email is fairly simple. Data is a challenge, but it's fairly easy to migrate, understandable. Third party apps can really trip you up if you don't put a bit of time into it. And the general advice I have, make sure they're current, make sure they're up to date, make sure they're not still running SQL 2000 or something old, which isn't supported. So always sure make sure they're up to date, whether that's you or the third party. Now, once you get your stuff to Office 365, that's generally not the end of the job. You're going to have to look at, is the local AD going to stay? You know, are we going to move everything? Is the AD, do I need the AD, the Active Directory? Do I need to move it to Azure perhaps and connect it to Office 365 or am I getting rid of it completely and running cloud-based identity? How am I actually going to do this? So what's going to happen to my AD server? Does it need to stay? If it needs to stay, can it stay on premise or do we have to look at putting it into a data center? Removing your local exchange server, Generally, just shutting it down is not going to remove it out of the scheme of AD. You're probably going to need to uninstall it. You may also need to go in and, for example, change the local group policy to stop your local clients pointing at a local exchange server which no longer exists. So again, decommissioning is not just a necessarily a matter of turning things off or shutting things down or stopping the services because there are other factors that interact with it to, for example, like group policy, point the local Outlook clients to a local exchange server that you may need to go in and change and update and work with, and again, plan the decommissioning process. So with that, let's look at, um, again, what's your process? So again, what's the process of decommissioning? What's the way that you're following through? How are these things going to be aged out of the system? So let's cover some best practices as we wind up. Like any migration, planning is the key. Sit down, plan it. The more planning you do, the better chance of success, the better chance of um, the less likely something of, of, of causing you a surprise. Um, automate, outsource what you can. PowerShell if you can, use the third party service like migration with Skykick. Um, again, they make life so much easier. Email migrations are pretty straightforward. I mean, most people are very, very familiar with them, don't have any issues with them, they understand once they read the documentation. Data, 
completely different story generally because you're moving from files and folders, basic files and folders, to a collaboration system like SharePoint and OneDrive. So again, know those systems, understand them, and then it's less of an impact. But data is always, the data, the files and folders is going to be the challenge. Don't forget your multifunction copiers. You know, you've got a copier that sends an email to the users when they print something or when they need to scan it. Um, how does that work? How's that going to send to the cloud? How's that going to deliver deliver emails? How does that work? Uh, seen a lot of cases where that is the last thing that's thought of, but again, user's point of view, that's the thing they really need day in and day out. So make sure that you look at these sort of silly little things like multifunction copiers. Remember that the adoption is more important for the user than the migration. The migration, the user doesn't care how you're migrating, the technical side of it, all they want to do is to be able to use the tools, the facilities, the services to get their job done. And really, the easier you can make that for them, the better you can show them how to use it. The, the way you can speed up their adoption of these products is generally going to improve the migration experience for them. And that will um, reflect on you. Again, get them excited about the new stuff. Show them some of the new stuff like Skype for Business. Easy to implement, no impact. Again, get them focusing on the new and the good stuff. And if you do have issues with the migration, which I'm sure most people will have in some way, shape or form, then it's not such a big issue from the users. And importantly, where can you add your value? Okay, so if you're just doing an email migration, walking out the door, you're not adding much value. Anybody else could do that. An automated tool can do that. But if you go in and do an email migration and then set up legal hold and set up the group retention policies, then manage compliance, um, do e-discovery, uh, I don't see a lot of that being done. So even in email, there's all these advanced features now available because we're looking at an enterprise version of Exchange which small businesses have never had before. Where's the value you can add beyond just the simple migration of copying emails and copying data? Where's the value add? What can you add to the migration that will help the user get their job done and unearth the uh, additional services that they can take advantage of? So the takeaways I have for you, ensure that you've got your DNS under control. Make sure that you have full access to the DNS or you can make the changes. You're confident they can be made in a time period that you require. Understand how long it's going to take you to get that data from one point to Office 365. That's going to be limited their bandwidth. There could be other issues. Again, understand that copying data to the cloud is going to take a long time, much longer than you expect. So again, make sure you factor all that in. Use the best tool for the job. Is that PowerShell? Is that the Microsoft tool? Is that a third party migration tool like Migration Wizard or Skykick? Again, what's the best tool for the job? Okay, don't just do it because it's technically smart or it looks fun or whatever. Again, you're running a business, you want to improve your profitability, which means doing it in a way that's as profitable as possible in the shortest time possible to give you as much profit as possible. Checklist, checklist, checklist. That's going to, again, save time, give you consistency, ensure that you can then take those and give those to other staff. That's how these third party systems that do migration work. They all automate a checklist. So again, inside your business, use checklists. Don't forget your mobile devices. Many people got them. They use them every day. They get very frustrated if they don't have their information on their mobile devices. So when you do the migration, go in and do the mobile configuration as well. And importantly, don't neglect the user adoption because how the users take to it is really going to determine how successful it is um, for you. And the other big thing takeaway is SharePoint and OneDrive is a big change from files and folders, a very big change from files and folders for users and for most resellers. So that means you're really going to have to speed up and learn at least at a very basic level what SharePoint is, what OneDrive is, um, how it works and basics so you understand it can talk to the customer because it's very different from the traditional files and folders that most people are familiar with. So with that, here's our Dicker data contacts. We will come back to this slide. Uh, don't forget the general email is microsoft.sales at dickerdata.com.au. Hit those guys up for any questions around licensing, any of the information that you've seen, suggestions, uh, feedback. Great to see it in there. So what I'm going to do now is hopefully is I am going to throw up a poll for you and I will ask you to make a suggestion for what you would like to see in the upcoming uh, presentations we're planning for July going forward. So next month there will not be a presentation because of the end of the financial year. Um, I would really appreciate you taking a moment to um, go in there and 
complete this poll I'll give you a few minutes to do that so that we know what sort of topics that you do wish to see of course you can send any suggestions to uh, microsoft.sales at dickadata.com.au you can also again hit me up at uh, director at CIOps with any suggestions and when we have um, some ideas on that um, we will then uh, use those as the basis for our webinars going forward in July so uh, hopefully it looks as though everybody has more or less voted so by this stage it looks as though the SharePoint and the OneDrive for Business is the winning topic for the next one um, certainly near and dear to my heart so we can certainly do that followed by Office 365 and Azure. So again, really appreciate you uh, taking the time to uh, do that. I'll just pop back to the slides now and just finish off. So again, thank you very much for attending these sessions. These sessions are recorded. They will be up. You will get an email um, where they're stored in uh, YouTube, so you can review them. Remember, send any questions through to microsoft.sales at dickadata.com com.au provide us feedback make sure that we're providing the information that you want and the topics that are covered we're looking to obviously grow um, what we can provide you in workshop wise and in webinar wise but with that again thank you for attending these sessions enjoy your end of year tax um, uh, holiday in inverted commas and we'll see you back on the 1st of July I will maintain I'll hang around here for a few minutes if you've got any questions just bang them in the chat but once again thank you very much for attending this session